thank you, Dr. Fufari. Um, you know that uh, the president of the commission, Oliver also, is arriving here next week. Uh, you still have time to send uh, through any embassy, European embassy you want, or you maybe you can uh, send an email that on the agenda that he uh, discusses with uh, Israeli leaders, uh, energy should be also on uh, the agenda. Uh, now you, uh, you know that uh, Bob Kagan uh, compared in the relationship between the United States and Europe, he compared uh, Europe to Venus and uh, the United States to Mars. You no, know, you brought the picture of the dancing, the tango dancing couple where you compare uh, or you bring together Russia and Europe. I wasn't, it wasn't clear to me who is who in the dancing couple. Uh, who is Russia and who is Europe. Uh, in the next presentation, you will probably add this detail. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it's very important. Uh, um, the last speaker today, except uh, summing up by uh, Professor Stetter, uh, is uh, Dr. Harold Vinegar, who comes from a company which does um, an issue which you brought up, uh, Dr. Fufari, uh, Israel Energy Initiatives, and they deal with the shale oil, or oil shale, I don't, I always confuse, oil shale. Uh, and it was mentioned during the day. Uh, now, uh, this is very important, especially if uh, the quantities which were mentioned in terms of the Middle East and Israel specifically are, uh, uh, the quantities are correct. Um, it is, and I have to say that, it is an issue which raises a lot of uh, uh, discussions on certain other aspects, uh, especially the environment. Now for the transparency uh, sake, uh, I have uh, approached the opposition, quote unquote, as I call them. Uh, they uh, were not uh, uh, able to uh, come today. And I promise that uh, whenever we hold another conference on this issue of energy, we will give them uh, the opportunity uh, to raise their own concerns. Uh, legitimate as they may be, uh, and uh, so I just wanted for the sake of transparency. Now, Dr. Vinegar uh, has been working uh, ever since he made Aliyah to Israel on this issue uh, in the context of the uh, Israel uh, Energy Initiatives, but he has a long career in this uh, uh, respect. Uh, worked for many years both in Shell Oil Company and the Royal Dutch uh, Shell, uh, where he was their chief scientist. Uh, and so uh, we are dealing with, or we, we will have the fortune of listening to a real expert on this issue. The microphone is yours, Dr. Vinegar. I'd like to uh, talk today on the synergy between uh, two treasures that uh, Israel has. Um, oil shale, enormous, enormous resources of oil shale reside in this country, and natural gas. And the two uh, merge together very nicely because natural gas is the energy source that's needed to produce oil from oil shale. And as has been stated by the previous speaker, the world does face an energy challenge. Um, the reason is basically that the world population is growing. 
And it's not just growing in the developed countries, but it's primarily growing in the undeveloped countries. And the undeveloped countries are today not using a lot of energy per capita. So that when they add population there and they increase their standard of living so that their energy consumption goes up per capita, you wind up with a real challenge. And the challenge basically is that uh, between where we stand now around 2010 and 2035, the uh, usage of fossil fuels will definitely increase. More oil will be used, more natural gas, more coal. And th particularly the use of oil is the one to be concerned about because there's a real shortage of oil in the world. Unlike natural gas, which is actually very, very common in the world, and coal, which is the other extreme, there's only a narrow geological window where oil is produced. And so it's extremely unlikely that uh, we're going to be able to keep up with the demand for oil in the future without the price rising quite significantly. And here you can see the oil supply curve of the world. On the horizontal axis, you're seeing the uh, trillions of barrels um, and the cost of production. So the first trillion barrels of, uh, of oil has already been used up. The world has used a trillion barrels of oil. And the second trillion barrels of oil is located in the Middle East and North Africa. We know where that is. And the uh, about half a trillion remains. And then this is all of the inexpensive oil in the world. We then take a jump up to more expensive oil in <coughs> deep water environments, in, in the Arctic, in enhanced oil recovery. There's a big jump in price. Suddenly you're up to uh, roughly $50 a barrel. And then that gets used up. At the rate the world is using up oil, this will all be gone in, in the uh, conventional oil in most of the uh, developed countries of the world. And so then one gets into the heavy oils and bitumens, the oil shales, gas to liquids. These are all much more expensive technologies. And so there's no doubt that the price of oil in the world is going up. And we want to make uh, oil as cheaply as possible because the remaining proven reserves in the world are in places that are not friendly to Israel. There is another type of oil, and that's called uh, oil shale and heavy oil. Generally, we call that unconventionals because when you drill a well, these things don't produce naturally. They don't come out under their own pressure. Um, they're at opposite ends of the spectrum. Oil shale is very, very young oil. It's in its solid state and hasn't been buried deep enough to have matured to become a liquid yet. And heavy oil is just the opposite. It went through the full maturation. It got expelled from the source rock into a trap, but it was so shallow that the bugs ate up all the light ends, leaving only the heavy stuff behind. So you got very young oil and very old oil, the two ends of the spectrum. These two ends of the spectrum are actually much more common than the middle part of the spectrum, which is conventional oil. And if you look around the world, uh, as I said, there's one trillion barrels of conventional oil left. There's about 13 to 14 trillion barrels of unconventionals. These uh, bubbles are the heavy oils in yellow, and the light blue are the oil shells of the world, and it's a logarithmic diameter such that the United States has uh, roughly one and a half trillion barrels of oil shale. Canada has about two trillion barrels of heavy oil. The Orinoco belt in Venezuela has about a trillion barrels. One thing you notice is that there's a heavy concentration of unconventionals in the uh, Western Hemisphere, and very little unconventionals where you find conventional oil. It is not um, a mistake. That exactly why there is unconventional oil. If the oil shale had been buried deeper geologically, you would have had regular oil. If the tar sands weren't shallow enough to have been eaten up, 
You wouldn't have heavy oil very shallow. So all these resources are shallow. You're not drilling to 20,000 feet. They're all found typically within 1,000 to 1,500 feet of the surface. Makes drilling extremely cheap. Um, now let's look at uh, the United States is the largest oil shale deposit in the world. But the second largest in the world is in a place that you probably haven't thought about it, um, Israel and Jordan. Sis sister deposits, between the two of them, about a trillion barrels. Israel alone has over 250 billion. There's no doubt about these numbers. Um, and it's quite producible at prices that are cheaper than the Arctic, very deep water. Th th this, is, uh, this is a resource that is today quite epi economic. Okay, so where are, where are these deposits in Israel? Where are they hiding? They're basically hiding along the coastal plain of Israel. They're Cretaceous age. They were deposited at the same time that the Jordanian deposits were. And you might wonder, how is it that Israel is so close to the Mediterranean and Jordan isn't? It's because 70 million years ago, the old Tephas, the ancient Mediterranean, came from the north. And Jordan and Israel were side by side. And they both got the same deposits. And then the plates moved, and there was a rift that went through the Dead Sea, and Jordan moved relative to Israel. But in 70 million years ago, Israel and Jordan looked identical. And so when, when at Shell we were exploring the oil shales in Jordan, we already knew that there were very, very similar deposits in Israel. So there's 250 billion barrels in Israel, conservative estimate. And let's see if I can move it. On IEI's lease in the central part of the Shvila Basin, we have uh, between 40 and 60 billion barrels on just our license area. Now the other thing that Israel has is tremendous gas discoveries in the eastern Mediterranean. About 37 uh, trillion cubic feet have been discovered so far. Uh, there's no doubt that that uh, will double and triple. And that's because when you take seismic data in the offshore, the quality of the seismic data is excellent. There's no doubt about the structures. Once you drill your first one, you prove up the type of sand you're dealing with. In, a, in this case, a, you know, a Darcy kind of very high permeability sand. You pretty much know that all of them are, are going to be like that. So there's going to be an enormous amount of gas discovered in the Mediterranean. And the synergy between uh, Israel's oil shale and its natural gas is the following. The gas is going to be coming onshore at Ashdod. And the oil shale is right over here. Blown up, you can see the uh, deposit here. There's the IEI license here. And everything that's in green is oil shale deposit. You can see it, not just the Shvila Basin, but the Beersheba Basin and the Hadera Basin and the Janine Basin. Um, even the Palestinians have a significant amount of oil shale. Uh, and Israel is extremely well set up for not just producing it, but refining it. Israel has two refineries built by the uh, British, the Haifa and the uh, Ashdod refinery. This one's only 30 kilometers from the oil shale. And pipelines already exist north-south, and both crude oil pipelines and finished product pipelines. So Israel's well set up for exporting through a lot to the Far East and to the Mediterranean to Europe. So the small size of Israel makes a lot of things quite practical, very short pipeline distances. Now the technology that has been the breakthrough in producing oil shale is the in-situ conversion process. Everybody has heard about the old mining uh, technologies that were used where you'd mine it like coal and you'd heat it up in these giant retorts and it really made an environmental mess and this is a, a baggage that oil shale carries with it. Everybody knows that for 100 years, oil shale has been the dirtiest of resources. But the breakthrough is the in-situ conversion process, where you actually heat the oil shale in the ground with horizontal wells, <coughs> very similar to what's done in Canada with tar sands, SAG-D wells, and in the, uh, 
and the Bakken, where we drill horizontal wells and produce the shale oil out of the solid rock. This is a very similar process, but it has the addition of heat because you have to convert the solid organic matter into liquid. So you drill horizontal wells, you heat the heaters in these wells, and the gases that are created are produced vapor phase through the production wells, leaving behind the carbon in the ground. It's a natural sequestration of carbon. We only suck out the light hydrogen-rich products, leaving the CO2 generation material behind. So it's possible with a technology like this to actually produce an oil shale and use less carbon dioxide than conventional hydrocarbons. You could also produce a lot more CO2 if you do it the wrong way. And so part of the thing our company does is to make the heating of these horizontal heaters as efficient as possible. So uh, over the years that I worked at Shell, I developed the various classes of electric heaters. These things are spooled on big spools, thousands of feet long. You just inject them into the horizontal well. This is one and a half inches in diameter. It's a self-regulating Curie heater that can never overheat. Beautiful, used in all of our, uh, our demonstration and uh, commercial tests, but only 45% efficient. So this will put out more carbon dioxide than conventional oil. The next step up is downhole gas burners, where you take your natural gas and you combust it in the horizontal section. This thing has the capacity of being a lot more efficient than electric, but has the disadvantage that you have to compress the natural gas to send it down the well. So this thing winds up only being about 60% efficient. Excuse me? Uh, of the heaters, about 550 centigrade. Temperature of the ground has to get to about 300 centigrade, but the heaters have to be hotter. <coughs> and the best technology is the molten salt technology. You basically heat a, uh, a salt, you liquefy it. The salt has extremely low vapor pressure. It's like uh, water, has the viscosity of water, but tremendous heat capacity. And so you use natural gas to heat the molten salt, and you send it down the well back to the furnace. This thing is 85 to, if you use solar for heating the molten salt, it's 100% efficient. These technologies on the right-hand side actually are between 5 and 10% less carbon dioxide emissions than conventional crude oil. And the energy balance is something that always comes up. How is it possible to heat the rock underground and still, uh, still have energy? <laughs> well, it's because you're dealing with enormously rich rock. This rock has so much oil, vastly more than a conventional reservoir. And so uh, when you use methane with one unit of energy, out comes, after heating the oil shale, a variety of products. Most of the energy is in the oil, the shale oil that comes out. Also make a large amount of LPG. And we make ethane and methane. And notice that the ethane and methane are more than enough to back out the original methane. So this thing, after you get started, is self-sufficient on its own natural gas. And then you have hydrogen, which is uh, used in the refinery to refine the oil further. What makes this so economical is the difference in price between oil and natural gas. As I said, natural gas is ubiquitous. It's all over the world. It's going to remain cheap far into the future. And it's not just because of shale gas and tight gas but also because of all the stranded gas that we never produce, we now have these floating platforms that can liquefy on site. So there's an enormous amount of offshore stranded gas that's never been produced. <coughs> so what's happening is that the price of oil since 2003 has been going up on an energy basis, and the price of natural gas has been going down. And there's about a, a 6 to 1 ratio here in... Uh, the price per energy of natural gas and the price per energy of oil. So the economic balance on burning natural gas to heat oil shale is not 6 to 1, but it's more like 25 to 1. For every dollar that Israel will earn from the natural gas, it can make $25 from that in producing oil from its oil shale. 
an enormous treasure, an enormous synergy between the uh, two tech, the two treasures here in Israel. And if you look at it as an integrated project, there's only one input. There's only one input to the oil shale system, and that's natural gas. We use that either to make uh, electricity by combined cycle gas turbine or to heat the molten salts. That heats the oil shale. You get oil, gas, and water out. Downstream processing gives you the methane and ethane to back out the initial natural gas. This is what comes out energy-wise, LPG, gasoline, jet fuel, diesel, no heavy ends. This process leaves all the heavy stuff behind, and it makes water. Three barrels of water get produced for every barrel of oil that gets produced. How is that possible? It's because the rock here in Israel has a large porosity that's full of water. So um, we have been exploring the Shvila Basin in Israel. Here's one of our drilling rigs. We've taken thousands and thousands of feet of core. We know this resource without a doubt. I can tell you at any spot within the Shvila Basin exactly how much oil shale, how rich it is. This is one of the richest deposits in the world. This is about 30 gallons a ton. It's over 1,000 feet thick, and it's very shallow and it's isolated from the aquifers. Unlike Colorado, where the aquifers come right through the oil shale, in this case, the aquifers are 200 meters below and separated by impermeable zones. So there's no risk to the aquifer in this technology. Um, I can pass this around. It's a, it's a chalk, very light. The lightness is due to the fact that it's got a lot of porosity-filled water and very uniform. Marine deposits, unlike Colorado, which are lake-type deposits, this was deposited all within a million years from a deep water environment, and it all looks the same. Very, very uniform. In the laboratory, we, uh, we heat the oil shale to look at the quality of the oil. Um, there's very little difference between the preheating shale and the post-heating shale. They look exactly the same. Only difference is the post-heating shale, this one, has a lot of the solid organic matter has gone off as a uh, liquid product. And the coke, you notice the difference in color? That's the carbon that's been deposited on the grains of the chalk being left behind in the ground. And this is the only technology that I know of that can control the quality of the oil that we make. So depending on the... Uh, the heating rate and the pressure that you have on the production wells, you can go anywhere from a uh, very heavy oil to a rosé to a very, very fine oil. The economic maximum is in the rosé color range. This thing is about a 35 API gravity, extremely light product, and it all looks like this. This is not the topping track. It's all generated in a liquid product like this. Um, okay. <laughs> I've got to hurry here. So um, obviously you have to do a pilot. I've done many pilots at Shell in several places in the world, in the United States and Canada. This technology works not just in oil shale, but as you might expect, it works in heavy oils, tar sands, bituminous coals. We've piloted in all of those locations. But of course you have to pilot it in Israel because you know, it has to be done here. And so this is the pilot that uh, we're going to do in the Shvila Basin, basically consisting of uh, six uh, vertical heater wells, production well, and a fluid uh, a handling facility. We're going to drill 300 uh, meters down, heat a 50-meter zone. These are monitor wells shown in green. I'm not shown as a, a directionally drilled monitor well that goes underneath the heated zone to prove that nothing is going down. This is just a quick uh, two-minute movie of how the process works. <laughs> if you don't mind, <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> um, so this will actually take you into the subsurface and show you exactly what's happening there. So the, uh, there are six heaters. There's the uh, treatment process units at the surface, the control units. The, this will be an electrically heated pilot. But underneath the ground... We're going to go down 300 meters here. 
There's the depth. These are the six heater wells and the center production well. There's an overburden of uh, clay called the dikia that blocks anything from going up. And underneath, an extremely tight chalk and clay combination called the manuka formation. So we're hundreds and hundreds of meters above the aquifer. And what's happening, this is the heating elements in these wells. You watch the temperature rise. The heating elements get hot. They transfer heat by thermal conduction. There's no fracturing here. This is not a hydrofract. Just heat going in by thermal conduction, gradually raising the temperature of the oil shale, cracking those solid organic molecules into shorter molecules that are vapors at that temperature. So this thing depletes like a natural gas reservoir, and you get all of it. It's not something we only get 30% of the oil. You get <laughs> over 95% of the oil comes to the surface. And that's why when I say we have 250 billion barrels, it's 250 barrels of producible oil that we have here in Israel. So you get gas and you get water coming out. And the gas and water go to the condensing unit, cool it down. And once it's condensed, the, uh, you have natural gas or shale gas and shale oil and water. You can see over here in the water tank, there's the water, there's the oil floating on top. And then you separate the two. There's about three times as much water as oil. And the gas has got to, is a sour gas, so it goes through absorbers to take it out. And then normally this would go into uh, the pipeline, but for the pilot, it's just going to oxidize it. Okay, so that is, that's basically it. It looks very real, but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> okay, I've, I've got to stop, but uh, we anticipate uh, going through the pilot, then a demonstration phase where we do it full scale, but in just one module. And then after the demonstration stage, we go commercial hopefully within this decade. Thank you very much. Uh, we uh, ran out of time, and so uh, I apologize for all those who uh, wanted to ask questions. Uh, this will be in the next, uh, the next Conf conference we will hold. Uh, before the last uh, before the last speaker before the last uh, speaker sums up, uh, Professor Stetter uh, sums up. I would uh, like to thank all the participants, especially the audience, uh, with the uh, patience uh, to. Uh, listen to this very instructive, informative, educational uh, conference that we held. Uh, as uh, General Yadlin said in the morning, this is the second in a series. We will have to come back to these issues, the strategic issues, the economic, to, as I said before, also to the environmental aspects of it. Mostly what interests all of us here is the regional or the leverage for regional cooperation, whether it is in uh, natural, uh, natural gas, whether it is in uh, what we just uh, heard about the quantities which are in Jordan, in Israel, uh, maybe even on the Palestinian side. And so uh, there is a lot that can be uh, done to turn all of these into uh, instruments for uh, regional cooperation, uh, and I promise you that we will come back to this issue. And now, uh, Professor Stetter summing up, and uh, I thank you, uh, IEPN. I thank uh, the Friedrich uh, Ebert Stiftung, uh, Ralph uh, Axel especially, Macro, uh, Dr. Nathanson, and so please end this conference. Yes, dear friends, uh, I 
don't want to say much. I think you all listen, so it's not really that I have to summarize again, telling you what you have heard all day. Although academics, as you know, they are tempted to do that. There's this joke that academics usually talk like that. First, they start and say, I'm going to talk now about this, and then they say what they're going to talk about, then they talk about it, and in the end they summarize what they just have talked about. So I'm not, I'm not going to do that, but make some general observations, and with that we, we will finish what I think was a very uh, successful and interesting uh, event. With many participants coming from, uh, from the EU, coming from uh, Turkey, coming from Israel, and many thanks to everybody who came here, to our Israeli friends, but also, al also to those who came from abroad. Unfortunately, we didn't have Arab participants here, which is a pity because obviously it's very much related to that, to the Palestinians. Uh, you're here. Ah, very good. But we didn't have them on the we didn't have them uh, on the panel. But the good the good news is this is a topic being talked about also in Lebanon. If you read policy reports, this topic is being talked about. And the IPN will produce a brochure uh, document about this conference in which we summarize the main uh, statements being presented here, the main ideas being discussed. And this will be distributed uh, to, to you, of course, uh, but it will also be online. And uh, our colleagues, our friends in Arab countries will have the opportunity to read that and also to think about what we have talked about, Casus Belli or Chance for Regional uh, Cooperation. Now, I'm not sure uh, really which of these two sides it is. It's uh, m maybe also too black and white. Uh, we haven't heard much about the casus belli. We have heard many hopes and wishes for regional uh, cooperation. We might not end up uh, in the European community for coal and steel in the early 1950s. This is, uh, is a hope we, we have for this region, certainly. Uh, and Samuel uh, referred to, uh, to that. This is a hope, but maybe it's a better status quo. This is something which I, I sense today. It, it might not immediately change the geostrategic setup uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean, but it might stabilize the status quo. And very often the stabilization of the status quo is not a good thing in this region, we know that. But maybe the dynamics we see here is a better status quo, which o over time then will change the para parameters in this region um, as well. We have heard about many things related to this natural gas issue in the end, also the, the oil issue, which I also find uh, very alluding. Um, in this brochure, we will summarize all these arguments. You, you can then come back to all the legal arguments we had here today. I would like to remind of the morning session. We talked about the economic uh, dimension of the whole thing, the geostrategic issues related to that. We even heard about now about the technical, uh, scientific aspects of it, and very important, uh, the administrative uh, issues, the regulative issues related to, to, to that. And of course, uh, that's an important issue for the European Union as well. So many thanks to all our speakers uh, for presenting these ideas. I would like to thank very much the INSS, uh, Amos, and, uh, and uh, also Odette. You are longtime partners of the IEPN, and we very much appreciate uh, and enjoy really working with you and continuing what already was a successful cooperation between uh, your institute and our project, and we very much like to continue with that cooperation uh, in, the, in the future. I would like to thank the staff of uh, the Macro Institute, uh, Bobby, the director is uh, here, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, Ralf Hexel, the director is here as well, the staff of Macro and, uh, and the Ebert Stiftung together with INSS have done a tremendous job, and uh, I think it's part of my role he now here to, to make that explicit and to thank you once again for that. Uh, clap. <laughs> <laughs> now, the outcomes of this conference will particularly be presented on our website. This is uh, www.iepn.org. Uh, I suggest and I recommend you, you, you have a look at this website. You can register uh, with us as well. We also have a Facebook group. You can become a friend of the IEPN. You will see also the history of this project. The IEPN is not something which just happened today. Many of you know this is a long-term project. We are working now together for 10 years having at least two meetings a year, one in Israel, one in the EU, in different places in the, in, the, in the EU. And we continue working, as you saw, in the spirit of critically, constructively discussing issues of, of mutual uh, interest. And we continue with that uh, in the future. Now, my wife, she uh, read this book. Some of you might know it, Eat, Pray, Love. And yesterday in the, in the taxi, we, we, we talked a bit about a similar uh, uh, th three um, things, slogan about uh, Israel. You're all aware of the Israelis, that you pray in Jerusalem, 
uh, working uh, is what is being done in Haifa. And uh, enjoying life is something in, in Tel Aviv. And I think this somehow relates to the larger issue of natural gas in the eastern Mediterranean. We pray for, and this was Rem Kortweg's uh, uh, wish list. This is what we pray for. Of course, that this is a better future. The European community for s uh, coal and steel might be something our kids, Amos, you said in the morning, that kids like to look in maps and that like to look at maps. Maybe future generations will look at maps on the eastern Mediterranean and see a regional organization coming up here and energy might be the starting point. This is the prey. This is the prey part probably of it. First, we have to work for that. And uh, I think we have heard many aspects how realistic frameworks look like. And there's a basis for that, a legal basis, a regulatory basis, uh, also the basis of making the realistic assessments. What is really in there? What are the costs? What are the benefits? How should they be distributed? There are good examples, Norway uh, and others, which have been referred to. I think we can also be thankful to Cyprus. The ambassador is there. We have seen a good example how one state can take uh, leadership. And I think uh, in regulating, bringing uh, more integration to the Eastern Mediterranean, this might be one day seen as an important step uh, your country, one EU member state, uh, has actually uh, done it. We have said, Rem has uh, rightfully said, that the EU is now very much looking inward. I think it's, it's right with what is called the Euro crisis. But I also think it's a Euro opportunity, really, an opportunity for Europe for integrating even more, building stronger institutions. And that's why I think that also, not just from an energy perspective, but from a foreign policy perspective, Europe will not turn its back towards this region, not just for economic uh, reasons, not just for geostrategic reasons, for all these reasons uh, combined. So there's a lot to work together for Europe, for Israel, for the Arab countries, uh, for Turkey uh, here in the Eastern uh, Mediterranean. This was pray, then now this was work, and then finally we might one day enjoy the whole thing, not sit in the dark, as, uh, as Amit uh, said, but really sit in the Middle East and meet in the Middle East where there's much light coming in. And I think this was an important contribution to that, and I look forward personally discussing that with you in the future. And I wish you, for today, a very good afternoon. Thank you very much.